Hi there, everybody. My name is Scott Grayson, and you're listening to Mentally Unscripted, the podcast where my co-host Stefan and I inspire you to think more clearly and have better conversations about the world. When you ride along with us, we'll take you on a journey that will show you there's always more than one way to look at an issue. You'll learn to think critically about what you see and hear and how to challenge the narratives that those in power want you to believe. You won't always agree with us, but that's the point. To learn that we can have deep conversations and learn from each other, no matter how different we are. This week, I find myself outnumbered by Stefan's as we welcome Stefan Kinsella to Mentally Unscripted. Stefan is a brilliant, articulate libertarian legal scholar who explains why the mainstream notion that intellectual property spurs innovation is wrong. He dives in by telling us why IP laws are simply government-issued monopolies that actually impede innovation. He then explains why removing IP laws would make us more prosperous, and he closes out the podcast by discussing other innovative ways creators can profit without protectionist laws. As always, we're building a community around Mentally Unscripted. So share this episode with your friends and interact with us at mentallyunscripted.com. And remember, the conclusion you reach is less important than the process you follow to get there. All right, everybody, this is episode 55 of Mentally Unscripted, and this is a very special episode because I never thought in my entire life that I would be outnumbered by Steffens, and yet I am here. <laughs> We've got two Steffens on the on the call with us. First is Stefan, co-host. Stefan, co-host, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Can't complain. I, I feel a little bit of competition here uh, with the name, but I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> awesome. And the other Stefan on the call or on the podcast here with us is Stefan Kinsella. Mr. Kinsella is someone I am very thrilled to have on. He is a libertarian legal scholar, a prolific writer, prolific podcaster, prolific podcast guest. Um, he's all over the place. I heard heard you, Mr. Kinsella, I don't know, three or four years on the Tom Woods show, heard you talking about how you're a anti-IP IP attorney, and I just thought that was great. I loved it. And uh, also the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. So happy to have you here. Anything else to the you want to add to the bio there? No, that covers it. Awesome. I uh, wanted to have you on because I'm been, like I said, I've been reading your stuff for a while, and I'm really interested in this idea of IP law. Now, I'm an attorney, but I don't know a lot about IP. Um, I know just enough to probably give people bad advice, and that's it. <laughs> but I really like the idea, really into the idea of how we can function in a society where we limit the amount of involvement of the state. And I think IP law and the way that you've been writing about it and talking about it, I think is an excellent way of showing people just how we can limit the the reach of the state while still maintaining an orderly society and still allowing people to profit off of their hard work without us degenerating into some you know Mad Max style uh, dystopian movie type thing. So let's just kick it off for I think most of our listeners probably are not legal experts. So what what is IP law just generally? Yeah, it's a it's a special specialty area of law which um, includes uh, patent law and copyright law and also trademark law and a few other things which are not as well known like trade secret and uh, some other areas, but primarily patent and copyright. So patent patent is the type of law that gives inventors some kind of rights in their inventions, which are like practical processes or machines. And copyright is a law that gives authors the rights in original creative works like novels or paintings or uh, movies or songs. So that's what IP law is, and it originates in two statutes in the in the U.S. in the federal federal statutes, which were um, uh, first enacted right after the Constitution was ratified in 1789. I think around 1790 or 91, the first two laws, um, and they trace their origins back to some practices and statutes in Europe, such as the Statute of Monopolies in Britain in 1623, and the Statute of Anne, and that was the Statute of Monopolies was kind of the origin of modern copyright law. I'm sorry, modern patent law. <clears throat> and you can see even in the title of uh, the, the British Parliament understood that patents were monopoly grants, um, which is one reason that we libertarians should oppose them and that people that call them property rights uh, are being a little bit dishonest and disingenuous. And copyright comes uh, comes from the statute of Anne of 17. 17- 
uh, 10. Um, um, and the purpose of that, well, that flowed from the, the attempt of the government and the church to stop people from printing works that they didn't want them printing after the printing press came out. So the origins of copyright are in censorship by the state and the church, and the origins of patents are in the grant of monopoly privileges by the state. So they're both rooted in totally unlibertarian and unjust uh, state practices and policies. Um, so it's kind of ironic that so-called advocates of the free market and private property rights support them under this this label of intellectual property. Um, originally, these laws weren't called property rights at all. They were never understood to be property rights. Even people that were somewhat in support of them understood that they were derogations from uh, the free market and private property rights and, and natural property rights, um, but they thought they were necessary for a certain purpose like to incentivize innovation or something like that. But they, they were under no illusions that they were anything but a temporary grant of monopoly privilege by the state. <clears throat> and when the free market economists in the 1800s started criticizing these laws saying, what the hell are we doing granting these monopoly privileges? We should just get rid of them because they are contrary to the free market and private property rights and contracts and all this. Um, the defenders, by then there had been entrenched industries that had grown up that were dependent upon these laws like the publishing industry, the book publishers, and an increasing number of manufacturing industries dependent upon patent laws. Um, so they said, no, 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 we don't want to abolish these laws. They're not, they're not, they're not monopoly privilege grants. They're, they're property rights. And everyone said, well, how can they be a property right? They don't attach to any physical or tangible or material or corporeal, and they expire if, after 28 years or 14 years or whatever, and property rights don't expire. And so then the guys said, oh, well, they're a special type of property right. They're uh, intellectual property rights because they cover things that are created by the product of your intellect. And just, just like you work hard on your farm to grow crops and you get the rewards uh, – you get the, to reap the rewards of your labor and your effort and your hard work, if you also spend hard work coming up with a new machine in, uh, machine design or, or a novel that pleases people or a painting, you should have a property right in that too because you know we should – the purpose of law, I guess, is to reward effort and to make sure people have the right to a profit, which of course is all nonsense. So the purpose of law is not to reward people to, or to give – even to give incentives. Uh, Certainly not to guarantee that you have an income from your hard work because lots of times you work hard on the free market and you make no profit. You know, you fail. Um, no one has a guaranteed right to a stream of income or to customers or to profit. Um, so the whole the whole theory is is flawed. But anyway, that's that's roughly what. I, so IP law is basically intellectual property law, which includes patent and copyright, which are modern statutory schemes, which I think are in complete opposition to private property rights, competition, um, and innovation. Actually, I think they actually stifle and distort and corrupt uh, artistic creativity and. Um, practical innovations. So they make us all poorer because they reduce the amount of innovations that we have, which is really what has made us richer in the last 200 years. Uh, it's the accumulation of technological knowledge. Um, and if patent law distorts that or, or, or impedes it, it makes us more poor. So how does patent and copyright uh, impede innovation, restrict creativity. Yeah, well, cop let's say copyright first. So copyright, I won't say copyright makes us more poor because copyright is about um, artistic creation. Um, in my view, patent law is worse because it harms the human race in, in a more material way, which we'll get to in a second. Copyright uh, is worse in another way because it lasts far longer in today's law. Originally, they both lasted about 14 years. Um, and then patent law gradually changed, morphed to about 17 roughly years. Copyright was 14 years, and you could renew it once for up to 28. And the idea of the 14-year term originally was based upon this arbitrary idea that um, if you're a, um, an artisan and you – you know, you're, you're you're a skilled artisan, and you make something. You have these apprentices, and these apprentices have seven year terms. So, mm. when your apprentice becomes free to go out and compete with you, he could he can use your ideas and compete with you. So the idea was, well, let's let's give the uh, let's give the artisan two apprentice terms of 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 breathing room, of, so he can be free from competition for up to two apprentice terms. I mean, it's totally arbitrary, but that's where it came from. But over the years, uh, the copyright lobby has gotten stronger and stronger, especially in the 20th century with the, with the music industry and the uh, and the movie industry. Um, and they've lobbied over and over and over and over again to keep extending the terms. And then we joined the Berne Convention, which is an international copyright treaty in the in 1980s. 
And basically that made copyright easier to get. It made it to be automatic. You don't have to file. Most people that talk about copyright don't know what the hell they're talking about. And it, this especially annoys me when, they, when, they, when they're in favor of it and they don't even know what they're talking about. Like they don't even understand the law that they're in favor of. They don't understand the difference between patent and copyright and trademark, which I understand they're complicated. But if you don't know what you're talking about, don't speak in favor of it, right? Um, so copyright um, is now automatic. So people say, well, hey, Kinsella, you're a hypocrite because you copyright your own works. It's like you don't know the hell you're talking about because I don't copyright my works. No one copyrights their works because ever since the Berne Convention, it's automatic. As soon as you write something down, you have a copyright that the federal government grants you whether you want it or not. You don't have to apply. You don't have to put a copyright notice on it. You don't have to register it. It's just automatic and you can't even get rid of it. It's basically inalienable. There's no way to get rid of it easily. Um, so when people blame people like me for hypocrisy for having copyright, that's like saying, uh, hey, Kinsella, you're, you're a hypocrite for opposing taxes and being subject to the tax laws. It's like, no, I'm against the tax laws. <laughs> I can't help it that I have to abide by the tax laws because they'll put me in jail if I don't. Uh, in any case, copyright lasts uh, right now for the life of the author plus 70 years, which is over a century in, in most cases. Um, and also copyright, what it does is it distorts culture because – it makes people do things that they can do, and it makes them avoid things they can't do. So like remixing or reusing things or like if I wanted to write a sequel to a novel, I couldn't do it. The court could get you, give an order and block me from doing it uh, like they did with uh, The Catcher in the Rye sequel. Um, or if there was a sequel to um, um, it's the Star Wars movies, you couldn't do that without permission. Courts would ban that. Uh, the courts banned the, uh, the movie Nosferatu, an early black and white movie because it was held to be a, a derivative work. Work of the Dracula novel by Bram Stoker. Um, so actually, copyright law literally leads to the banning of books and, and, and art, which facially violates the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of the press. And copyright law clearly violates freedom of the press. Um, and my view is that means copyright law is unconstitutional because uh, the copyright law is based upon the copyright clause in the 1789 Constitution, but the Bill of Rights with the First Amendment was enacted in 1791 by a different Congress, and to the extent that there's conflict, then the later provision always governs under legislation and constitutional interpretation. Um, and the Supreme Court has actually recognized that copyright law and um, the First Amendment are in, con in tension, they call it, or in conflict. But instead of saying that, well, that means that, that the copyright law has to fall to the extent that it violates the First Amendment, they say, well, we have to balance them. So, you know, everyone says that America has strong First Amendment protections and that um, you need a compelling government interest to violate First Amendment rights. That's not the case in copyright. So, you know, you need a compelling state interest or you need a copyright uh, law. I guess. Hmm. Um, so copyright, uh, it reduces the amount of remixing and artistic works that would involve copyright. And so copyright impedes the – like some documentaries can't be made or they have to be cut because they have photographs or pictures of buildings or people's faces or works. Uh, so it, it totally hampers uh, artistic creativity uh, and distorts it. I would say it distorts it. Also, um, it's being used now as a threat to, co uh, to internet freedom because – the internet is the world's greatest copying machine, and so there's rampant piracy, and so you have all these six strikes and six strikes laws, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and and various webs websites are taken down all the time. YouTube videos, are, I think there's a million YouTube videos taken down. Yeah. I don't know every every month or every three months or something because of robotic automatic robot takedown notices uh, claiming copyright infringement. And even if it's not an act of copyright infringement, the YouTube and Google have to take it down because if they don't take it down, then they lose the safe harbor of the DMCA, which which would otherwise mean that they are subject to contributory copyright or secondary liability for the infringing acts of their users as if they were a publisher and they would they would just be shut down. So so it's led to literal censorship. Millions of YouTube videos are taken down all the time because of copyright and websites are taken down all the time by the uh, by the by the federal government. Go ahead. So, so yeah, so a question about that um, just to make this really concrete. So I think someone who doesn't have uh, a perspective on this who's just kind of raised in the system, right? That here is like patents are good. They protect the the individual creator. Uh, same with trademarks. Um, maybe maybe an example of something something said like, well, J.K. Rowling uh, writes this book, uh, Harry Potter, and 
someone else gets a copy of the transcript and they have better relationships to publishers, can they now go and get this published and reap all the rewards? And, um, or they've, you know, they, they basically write an equivalent book, um, you know, word for word. And, and they, they have a, I mean, I guess that's just photocopying, right? But like, is that, is that a material concern? Are they thinking about it? I, I, I sense well, they may be thinking about it the wrong way. Well, I think it's a mistake. I have a, 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 a talk I did a few years ago. It's called uh, something, a Locke's big mistake. Like it was a mistake from the very beginning. It was basically the labor theory of value and the labor theory of property, which I think have corrupted the entire world of political philosophy and legal philosophy. Um, John Locke's argument, which is roughly right in its conclusions, is that uh, if there's an unowned resource in the world, which is a type of thing we use as a means, a scarce means of action, a thing over which there can be conflict, which is a rivalrous resource, you know, a physical object or a piece of land or your body, um, we have property rights in those things to settle who who get who has the right to control it. That's what property rights are, and the and the and the two primary rules that we determine who owns a resource when there's a dispute is original appropriation or first use. Who, like who owned it first, who started using it first, because the first user has a better claim than latecomers. That's what property rights mean, that the existing owner can't be ousted by someone that comes later. And the very first user has to have a better right than a second person, because otherwise no one would be able to use resources in the world that were unowned in the first place. So sort of like Mises' regression theorem for money, you have to go back and there has to be a right to use things that are unowned because no one owns it. And so they don't have a right to complain if you start using it. And if you didn't have that right, then we would all die. So people have to have the right to use things. And once you use it, you're the first owner and you have a better claim than a latecomer. So that's original appropriation of lock. And then the second principle will be contract. If you're the owner, then you can give it to someone else by contract. So Mm -hmm. just those two principles alone basically can tell you who owns everything. I mean, that's all you need. Uh, pe- but people assume that creation is one of those principles because they say, well, if you create something, you're the owner. And the reason they say that is because Locke's argument, he says, well, you own your body because God gave it to you, and therefore you own your labor because that's what your body does. And therefore, if there's an unowned thing in the world and you mix your labor with it, like by by transforming it or putting a fence up or building a farm or whatever, um, then you have t- you've mixed your labor with that thing and you own your labor as a substance like – and if you don't own the thing you mix it with, you would lose ownership of your labor because they're another mixed in together. So the, the the presupposition there, or the or the um, or the metaphor, is that labor is a thing that you like as a substance that you own that like exudes from your body and that you own and that goes into other things and you maintain ownership of it. And that is like a completely non rigorous confusing and false metaphor. <clears throat> and it's very similar to Marx, the, the Adam Smith, Ricardo, Karl Marx labor theory of value, which is that the reason objects have a value and it's sort of an objective or intrinsic value is the labor that the worker put into it, which is mm-hmm. you know what underlies the, the communist idea that employers are exploiting their workers if they make a profit because they're taking some of that surplus value of the labor. And you know the whole thing is all confused. So um, I think that what, what you said earlier is like uh, copyright protects the creator. It does protect the creator, but what does it protect them from? It protects them from competition. But the natural free market libertarian private property state of affairs is is this. You live in a world, and if you have private property rights, no one has the legal right to use a resource that you have a right, to, uh, and that's a scarce resource. And you can determine that right by those two principles, by original appropriation or first use and contract. So if you have a resource that you bought from someone who owned it or that you found yourself and transformed it, then you're the owner. And that's it. But if you have information that guides your actions that you find useful, like you 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 know how to uh, grow grow crops, right? You know how to uh, raise animals. You know how to build a house or build a farm or or make or make machines or devices that you sell to people. You know how to do this. This is useful knowledge. You can keep the knowledge to yourself if you want to. But sometimes you might need to reveal it to the world. If you write a novel, you know, you're not going to make any money unless you sell it. But when you sell it, you're telling people, hey, here's a here's a useful combination of words that you might find pleasing, right? Or if you tell them, I discovered oil over here, or here's how to make a log cabin. If you tell people that, or if you show them how to do it by building a log cabin that's publicly visible, or you start selling the logs to make log cabins, you're revealing information to people. So when you reveal information to people, you can't complain that they use that information. This is how the human race advances, by people learning things from observing other people or hearing other people say things. So um, so basically, copyright and patent protect the creator of useful knowledge 
from competition, but you don't have the right to be protected from competition because competition just means people see what you do and they emulate it to some degree or they learn from it and make an improvement or they may copy it exactly. But in either case, they're only doing it because you chose by your actions to make this this information public. And once you do that, you can't complain. But just to, to quickly circle back to the earlier thing, and then if you want to ask me about either one of these, I mentioned copyright is problematic because it distorts culture and it censors speech, and it also is a threat to internet freedom, which is a problem for libertarians because the internet is a great tool we have um, to fight state surveillance and state laws, right, to spread information about what the state's doing. And so anything that restricts internet freedom is a problem for libertarians, and copyright law does that um, because it prevents people from saying what they want to say quite often. Um, patent law, and I, think, I still think is worse even though it doesn't last as long because it, it actually impedes innovation. It impedes innovation because – Let's suppose you come up with a useful machine or process, and you get a, then you apply for a patent. By the way, no one does this because of patents. They just do it because they need to solve a problem or to make a better product. But then once they have the right to apply for patent, they do it because once they get that patent, they can use that to stop people from competing with them for 17 years. Okay? So once you have a useful new product and you have a patent on it, your incentive to keep improving is reduced because you have no competition for 17 years. So your innovation goes down because you can just charge monopoly prop, monop, monopoly prices for, uh, for for 17 years and get monopoly profits. Um, so you don't have as much of an incentive to keep innovating. And by the same token, your would-be competitors never come into existence because they don't bother to take your new mousetrap or your new, your new plow or your new printing press or whatever it is. You have a patent on a phonograph, light bulb, whatever, airplane, um, you know, genetically altered seed, whatever, because they can't they can't sell that, and they can't – so they don't bother to learn how to do it, and they can't make an improvement because the improvement would also in most cases be covered by the patent. So it reduces the amount of innovation by would-be competitors as well. So the original inventor, his his innovation re is reduced, and his competitors don't uh, compete as much, and therefore they don't innovate as much in his space. So there is no doubt that innovation is reduced by the patent system, and it is also distorted. It's distorted because um, you tend to innovate in areas where you can get a patent on it. That is practical gizmos, but you can't get a patent on laws of physics or mathematical theorems because they're too abstract. So the incentive to do those things is relatively reduced, so it distorts everything. So when you distort innovation and when you reduce innovation, you, you reduce the cumulative knowledge that we accumulate as a human race over time, and that knowledge is what makes us more efficient at using the scarce resources at our disposal, and that is what makes us richer, learning more and more ways to manipulate the world, right? Uh, it's not that – we're not richer now than the Romans were because we're smarter. We're probably stupider <laughs> but because of welfare and the, and the evolutionary – you know the idiocracy effect, uh, but we have more technological knowledge that has cumulatively developed that we can we have at our disposal. I think that's why we're richer. So anything that slows down the pace of the increase of human technological knowledge impoverishes – relatively impoverishes the human race. Who knows? If we hadn't had patent law for the last 100 years, we might have flying cars by now and you know, a little Mr. Fusion uh, uh, DeLorean cars in our, in our garages, but we don't know because – that has been killed by the state. It's the, it's, the, it's the unseen cost of state regulation. But anyway, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys. So how would you respond to the argument, though, that without intellectual property protections, we wouldn't have any – there would be no incentive to innovate in the first place. So any reduction in innovation that comes from these, uh, these laws is just a trade-off we have to make to get the right. original innovation in the first place. Well, several responses. One response is uh, – first of all, it's not an argument. It's just a question. <laughs> Posing is an argument. It's a loaded question. Um, and the assumption of the loaded question is that um, even though – even if they acknowledge my claim that there's obvious distortions and impediments to innovation and mammoth costs to the patent system, let's say, lawyers' fees like mine and lawsuits and in increased insurance costs and all these kinds of things because of, of lawsuits um, – um, hampered free trade because of the International Trade Commission, uh, you know, uh, blocking imports because they violate patents, all those kind of things. Then what they – their comeback is, yeah, but the patent system also uh, makes some innovations possible because some, some innovations, you couldn't re recoup your costs because of the competition. So now you can because you have – you can recoup your costs because you can charge a monopoly price for 17 years. <laughs> 
So what they're saying is, okay, yeah, we, we reduce some innovation, but we have more innovation on the other side. But then they would have to argue that the difference is is still positive. Like like we 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 impose seventy five billion dollars of net loss on the economy because of lost innovation, but we have eighty eight billion in in increased innovation, so the net is thirteen billion. So we're all better off. Well, they'd have to come up with these numbers and prove it, which they never even attempt to do, and which is impossible to do uh, if you're an Austrian economist who believes value is subjective, <laughs> right, and, and and not interpersonally comparable. But uh, it, and not only that, all the evidence is in my favor, showing that it's just a, it's just a net loss overall, right? But the the fundamental argument is that the purpose of law is not to give these incentives because there's no end to that. The purpose of law is to do justice by respecting property rights. You, you, you lay the ground rules for who owns what, and then you let people compete and innovate and interact with each other uh, on a commercial and non-commercial and, and civil society and scientific and artistic basis, however they want. And whatever happens is what happens in society. The purpose of law is not to sit there and have some committee analyzing the market for market failures where the market, a pure free market that doesn't have these artificial incentives – breaks down and has an underproduction of innovation, and we're going to tweak the market by fixing this, by having a government grant these monopolies, which we can never measure anyway. Like the whole thing is ridiculous. Uh, if you really believe that the whole purpose of law is to maximize innovation, then we should tax people at 98% and, and reward innovators with a prize every year. I mean, there's no end to how much, because let's say that they're right, that we have X innovation without patents. And by the way, no one can with a straight face argue there's zero innovation without patents or zero artistic creation without copyrights because there's always been innovation and artistic creation throughout history before these modern laws. There would all so, – and their argument is not that. Their argument is that you have no creation without IP law. Their argument is that you have – you won't have enough. So they have in their mind that the free market would have some innovation, but there's an optimal amount that's above that um, and that we're – so, so the market is suboptimal. There's market failure in effect, right? Um, and so what they're saying is if you introduce these government – artificial government grants of monopoly privilege, you can raise the natural amount of innovation up closer to the optimal amount, something like that. They have no evidence for this whatsoever, by the way. This is just the, their theory. Um, but – even if they're right, then the the amount of innovation you have incentivized with your patent system still might be suboptimal, right? Because there might still be some pharmaceuticals that you could – that would take $10 billion to produce that you still can't recoup even with a patent monopoly for 17 years. So the government needs to give you $10 billion on top of that. You know, I mean there's just no stopping point to this logic. So – or put it this way. Instead of having a 17-year patent term, why don't we make it 38 years? Let's double it or let's triple it or let's make it infinite or let's make the penalties not be merely the payment of monetary damages. Wow. Let's make it criminal like copyright law is criminal. You can go to jail if you if you download um, or if you upload uh, a movie onto the internet. Some, some, some guy went to jail for a year for uploading the Wolverine movie a few years ago. I mean <laughs> there are criminal penalties for copyright. Um, so why not have – why not? Have, uh, there was a, a grad student in, in Britain, Richard O'Dwyer several years ago who had a website with hyperlinks to pirated copyright material. He didn't post them himself. He just had hyperlinks, which is basically giving people information saying, hey, if you want to find pirated information, you can go to this website. Mm -hmm. And the United States uh, tried for several years to extradite him to the US to face federal criminal, you know, to go to federal prison in the US. He, he was a grad student, his life was ruined. He, you know, he was fearing going to prison in America for just having a website. I mean, it's it's insane. So the point is you could have you could have criminal pun punishment punishment for patent infringement if you really want to incentivize innovation. And why not why why just criminal punishment? How about how about uh, capital punishment? You could execute people for doing it, which, by the way, was done in France when people would have buttons that weren't approved. They would they would torture them to death. I mean, <laughs> IP law is a serious thing. So you know, David, that's that's. A, I, I was thinking the real crime is that he was hosting Wolverine and not a better movie. But uh, I guess we can, <laughs> we can move beyond that. No, uh, no you're confusing. It? There's two guys. Richard O'Dwyer was hosting. He was he was hosting Links. There was a, there was a guy in America who uploaded the Wolverine movie. And he yeah. Was okay. It. Yeah, well, that's yeah, he uploaded yeah. it. If it had been, if it had been uh, the Godfather, maybe maybe that year would have been worth it. Uh, no, no. Um, you know, you know, the other thing I was thinking about the the equivalent of having the hyperlinks and, and it's it's the equivalent of being somewhere and saying that's the neighborhood that you go to if you want to buy drugs. 
right? That's, I mean, maybe with a few more instructions, but that's the analog, right? Correct. That is an like, analog. And, well, and you go, that's, that's pretty, it's pretty insane that someone, I mean, you go to like, like right now in San Francisco, I see everyone can tell you if, if you want to go get high and get crazy, you go to the Tenderloin, right? No one, no one's thinking you're going to arrest them for sharing that information, right? No, although there are some laws that outlaw drug paraphernalia and things like that. So even yeah. things that are not themselves illegal, if they're too much of a causal factor in people doing things that the government has also arbitrarily made illegal. Uh, look, for copyright, um, uh, the law has evolved according to the – in the Supreme Court uh, so that there is a certain amount of fair use so that – Suppose you 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 licensed a copy of um, of a movie or or, let's, or, or or a song, and you, so you have a licensed copy. So you're not infringing copyright, but you want to make a backup copy at home, right? This back in the old days before streaming, you want to make yeah. a backup copy. Yeah. Some some court decisions say I think I think it's established law that if you make a personal private backup copy for non commercial use, just as a backup because you already paid for it. That is not infringing copyright, although it's technically a copy, but it's a fair use. Okay. It's called a fair use. Mm -hmm. However, the D the DMCA said that if, if, if a copyright holder embeds digital rights management, copy protection in the medium that they sell, like a DVD or Blu-ray, for example, right? Um, and it's designed to protect, it's de designed to prevent people from copying things, right? Even when they have the right to copy it, right? Under fair use, it's designed to do that. If you sell or buy a, a device like a computer that can circumvent that copyright protection mechanism, the DRM, that itself is a is illegal, even if using it would be legal. So like yeah. it's like the paraphernalia, which would be right. the anti-circumvention. And by the way, that used to be a specialized piece of hardware perhaps, but now it's just a computer. Maybe it's an iPhone like yeah. because they're so smart now. So any general purpose computer is basically illegal because it could be used to circumvent DRM. Like the, the absurdities yeah. that come from copyright and patent law, because they are non-objective and they attempt to give rights and things that cannot be the subject of property rights, which is information, there it's like when you divide by zero, you can get any result. If you make information illegal, or I'm sorry, if you make information ownable, then you're necessarily going to get absurd results, which is what annoys me is when people object, they sort of take my side and they say, or they don't take my side, but they say, oh, we agree with you, Kinsella, we need to reform patent and copyright because there's all these abuses. Like, no, there's no, there are no abuses of patent and copyright. It, the law works as it's supposed to work. It's just the law is inherently absurd. Every mm -hmm. good, the best possible example you can give me of a patent or a copyright is itself still absurd. In my view, so, so is it is it fair if I was just going to be you know layman simple simpleton kind of expressing this? The principle is that the creation of these new works uh, and this creation of this identification of new knowledge is not actually property. Well, I, I would be I would be more precise about it. I think the word property, technically speaking, should be restricted to the relationship between a human actor uh, or a person and a resource. So it, if I have a television. People say that's my property, but the right way to say it is I have a property right in the television. It's not property. Okay. It's, it's it, but you know what I mean. And the re the yeah. reason is once you put it the way you put it, then people start asking the question: Hey, are you saying that ideas aren't property? It's like no, I'm not saying ideas aren't property. I'm not saying a television is property. What I'm saying is a television is a type of thing over which there can be conflict and dispute. And so property rights are assigned in those things to avoid the dispute or the conflict to make conflict be avoidable. Um, I would say there are certain things that we can identify with our concepts and our words in the world that are just not the types of things in which there can be property. Because a property right is always enforceable by a law, right? The word enforce is in there. Force, mm -hmm. physical force means the legal system and human actors can use physical force to grapple with and to control and to sanction and to try to stop these things. Force can only be applied to physical things in the world. These are causal actions against causal things. Um, so all laws are always applied – are laws that are enforceable by physical force, and physical force can only be applied to tangible, scarce, rivalrous things, the things that can be owned. So it's nonsensical. To, you you literally – it's not that I think that it's wrong to have a property right in an idea. It's impossible to have a property right in an idea because the law can only affect things that, that it can affect. So for example, if I have a copyright, I don't really have a copyright – I don't really have a property right in an idea. <clears throat> Rather, the the notion that I should have some protection over my ideas is the motivation for the law. But the law itself is really a property right in, in other people's physical stuff because I can use my copyright to get a court order enjoining someone 
from using their factory to print a book. So I'm really I'm really being given by my copyright a property right in other people's ink and paper and printing press, right? Which I never I mean it's a transfer of property mm. rights from them to me. So the problem with it is that now the property right in that printing press is being identified not by the two principles of original appropriation and contract, but just by government decree. Right, it's a government decree of a negative servitude or a negative easement, um, and a negative easement, which is when some one person has a veto right or how, over how you can use your resource, perfectly legitimate if it's if it's done consensually by contract. This is the basis of homeowners associations or restrictive covenants. Like I can grant my neighbor the right to keep me from using my house. Um, as an airport or a pig farm or something like that, or painting it orange, right? Because I gave it to him. Uh, but just like a girl who consents to sex is not being raped, but if she doesn't consent, she is. Consent is what makes the difference. So if I consent to this right over my property, like I granted by contract, it's fine. But in patent and copyright, the government just grants that negative easement to my neighbor or to some other guy who who, who mm-hmm. files a paper with the government saying, I came up with this idea first. The government gives them a negative easement over everyone else's property, even though those people didn't consent to it. That's the fundamental problem with, with patent and copyright. So, so, Scott, I know we have a lot of other questions, but I, I have one that's very future yeah. facing. Yeah. Can I can I explore it? Yeah, keep going. Maybe, maybe. So, so I, I think um, there's... There's certainly the idea. I'm imagining your solution to this would be to abolish these uh, these rules, these laws. Is is that fair? Absolutely. There is, there is no replacement. It's it's just take them out. Yeah, especially patent and copyright because they are purely creatures of statute. They didn't evolve and they could not evolve on the private common law like trademark did. I would abolish trademark law too, but it did evolve on the on the common law based upon a okay. similar mistake, by the way, the, the idea that you can own a reputation, which is the idea behind defamation law, which we also would abolish. Okay. But patent and copyright, yes, I would abolish them. Look, there are some government programs that you could make an argument that we shouldn't abolish them immediately because – of the repercussions, like for example, uh, I don't know, the Federal Reserve or maybe Social Security or something like that. Uh, but some laws, there is n- there's nothing redeeming about it whatsoever, like the drug war um, or uh, or uh, or IP law. And by the way, I would put patent and copyright law up there with the other five or six evils that libertarians always point to as being the worst things the state does, like the dr- like public education, um, welfare, the drug war. War itself and the central the central bank and, and inflation and Federal Reserve that kind of stuff. Patent law is up there because it yeah. does impoverish us. So, so and and this is this is where I'm I'm thinking about this. So I imagine a world, and if you just bear with me for a minute, you you have a system right now which incentivizes the enforcers of said laws not to repeal them, right? Correct. Um, and so wh- where could that change, right? You could, you could imagine a benevolent actor or a set of actors are able to take over. Right. And maybe there's a set of other type of scenarios. Well, but, but, but one, if, if I could just explore one that I think is, yeah, is going to be happening sooner rather than later is w- what do we do about the works that are created by machines directed by, by actors, right? Because like, for example, I was, I was coming across a, a service that does, um, it uses machine learning technology just to create brand new songs. Okay, well, that in theory, uh, if you let's say you harness all of the cloud computing power out there and you just set it in a direction for 30 days and said, create every single song you could ever imagine, it could, in theory, create most of the works that are going to be created by humans in many different ways over the next so many years. And if it's already given protections, would that computer have developed, you know, created a bunch of stuff that's already protected? Now the humans who yeah. are theoretically coming up with new stuff. So there's an explosion of content created by machines to the point everything is is copywritten yeah. to the point where you're constantly having to deal with this conflict. Does that force our our lawyer or the the law system to to change? Well, so I think what's happening is that, like I said, if you divide by zero, anything's possible. And when you have these laws, which are unnatural, mm-hmm. you're going to have absurd results. And this is – as technology develops, you're going to have answers that are uh, – things that are unanswerable and that the law even – there's no, like the – 
the answer a court's going to give is going to be arbitrary. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they've slowly dealt with some of these things. Like originally the question was, is photography, for example, uh, an artistic creation? Because you're just recording facts, right? You're pointing a lens at something and yeah. you're recording facts. Over time, they said, well, the photographer has a certain skill, the way he aims it, the way he lights it, whatever. But that's led to absurd results. For example, there are some famous photographs, right? And photographs are covered. And by the way, the the photographer is the, is the author of a photograph, which means if you hand your camera to a stranger or your phone to a stranger at Disney to take a picture of you and your family, the stranger owns the copyright. So you theoretically can't even copy it anymore <laughs> um, without getting his permission, and you don't know who he is because he's long gone. So then, <laughs> can, can we demand the phone from them then? And say I'm keeping your phone because it's got my copyrighted yeah, material on there. I think you would. I think you would say he, he's he's giving you an implicit license to get your phone back and to have the. The photograph he took, but what the license terms are, who knows? Right. <laughs> um, but there was a case where um, uh, there's a famous photograph. Like I don't know, some guy went to the Grand Canyon and he took a, a shot, which is a famous photograph. And if you, and everyone wanted to make prints of it, but they had to pay royalties to do that. So some guy went to the Grand Canyon on the same day of the year or the same weather conditions, the same exact spot, the same framing. He took he took his own photograph, and that was that was held to be copyright infringement. It was held to be a derivative work of the original photograph, even though it was a, its own original photograph. So is that the right answer legally? There is no right answer because the law is not – legislation is usually non-objective, and there's, it doesn't make any sense. It's always absurd. And you've had these cases where uh, someone uh, – some, some, some ape, I think a Macau or whatever this ape was uh, a few years ago, stole someone's camera and took a bunch of selfies. So the question is, who owns the copyright <laughs> or is there a copyright in it? Or if you have a surveillance camera outside of your 7-Eleven, you know, I mean, who's taking that? Uh, because, you know, you could say, well, the guy who placed the camera is doing what a photographer does. So, or if you throw these cameras, there's these three-dimensional cameras, not three-dimensional, but they're, they have like yeah, spheres, right? Yeah. You throw them up in the air and it takes a picture. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, right? Or what about NASA satellites? They're up in outer space and they're taking pictures. The government owns them, plus they're an international or outside of internationals. They're up in outer space. And there are outer space treaties, by the way, that deal with copyright, which is ridiculous. Um, and when it comes to AI, things like that, in fact, there was a, a stupid stunt pulled a few years ago by this, I think, Damien something. I've got it on my web my website. Um, what they did was they 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 had a supercomputer generate all the possible melodies within a certain uh, set of parameters, like eight, mm-hmm. eight melody, yeah. eight note melodies with a certain bit resolution. So, so like they have like 17 petabytes of songs and within there is basically every new melody anyone could ever think of in the next okay, yeah. Yeah. 50 years. And it's like, so, but the problem is that stunt proves nothing because for patents, you can't get a patent if there's an invention that is already well known and publicized. So if you could have an AI generate every possible invention and publicize it, maybe that could anticipate every invention and make patenting obsolete. But for copyright, you don't have to be you don't have to be the first originator of something. It's just that like if so Ayn Rand writes Atlas Shrugged, no one's going to make the same uh or, or or great expectations or whatever. It's very unlikely someone will originally independently create the same thing. But if they did, they would have their own copyright in it. So in the case where you have a machine exhaustively do these melodies, um, and someone happens to independently come up with the same melody in their song later, they would not be blocked by that. So it's the stunt proves nothing. In fact okay. in fact they would be able to um uh to make derivative works and they would be able to sell their own melody because they came up with it originally and independently. So it proves nothing. Um, Now, what I do think has happened is in the world, because copying has become so easy with digital technology and with the internet and torrenting and all this kind of stuff, um, piracy has become so rampant that copyright is almost impossible to enforce except on a big institutional level like you know mm-hmm. across CBS and the and the HBO and the big media companies they have to abide by it but any of us can go get a book or or a song or a movie anytime we want by going on the internet so basically I don't see copyright changing because it's too entrenched, and the and the error that I identified this labor theory error is so entrenched in everything we talk about it permeates all the law in the world and all the political thinking, I don't see it changing by legislation. However, yeah. it's being changed by technology. And right. for patents, I do think 3D printing, if it ever matures to a point where we go from the dot matrix stage to the laser, the color laser printer stage, yeah. the equivalent of that, you know, 50 years from now, people will be able to print 
whatever the devices they want in their own basement without anyone knowing because they'll get the file from an encrypted server, right, uh, the, the design. So I do think technology is the only way to uh, fi- finally do an end run around these ridiculous laws. So if I could summarize, um, the, the, these laws may just become completely unenforceable, yes. right? To the, and, and that's kind of what you're saying is already existing today at, 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 at many uh, levels of resolution, right. right? Like, like yeah. with pri- pirating, you can get it. Um, yeah, there, there's there's some trepidation I have when I hear about companies trying to sequence genomes or, or do other types of, of processing, and then they, they want to put some protection rights about the work that they've done. I, I yeah, as a layperson, I kind of think that, and it, it, it does trouble me. I'm going, well, you know, if we're going to have design babies, I'm, I'm not going to have to buy yep. a, you know, certain type of patent for somebody who, who just identified something that was already existing there naturally. Yeah, um, one of my, one of my friends is David Kepsel. He's not a libertarian exactly, but he's kind of a, yeah, he's, he's an IP skeptic and he's a specialist on this. He's written some stuff on, um, on, um, the, the, the dangers and the problems of, of patenting of genetic information, which, mm-hmm. which is being done. Yeah, that's yeah, it's, terrifying. It's, it's a horrible danger, but uh, uh, these unnatural laws become – it's like the drug war. The drug war is hard, hard to enforce, although that's going after physical things so they can do some damage, right? Um, yeah. The good thing about the, uh, the, the, the informational realm is it's harder and harder, harder to police, I think. So if we were to obliterate the IP laws, would you favor – just leaving the void wide open and telling yes, entrepreneurs absolutely. to figure out I would, how to I would I would not be in favor of a grace period or a transition period whatsoever because okay. um, I think it does nothing but destruction. There's there's literally nothing good about IP, and there are no good arguments for IP in my view. Uh, same thing with the drug war. I mean, you wouldn't favor like a phasing out of the drug war. You know, for other things, you could come. You could argue that well, there should be a phase out for public schools, maybe for uh, you know America policing the oceans. You know, maybe you don't want to you don't want the, the the collapse to be worse than the problem, but not for, not for patent law. I think it, patent and copyright law do nothing nothing but but evil in the world. So then you would just leave it up to the entrepreneurs and the authors and artists to figure out how to profit off of their works. Yeah. Um, however, they would. Which they're which they're having to do now. By the way, you know, uh, musicians can't make as much money selling CDs and LPs like they used to. They they've they've gravitated towards other business models: merchandise or performances, you know, concerts, uh, streaming rights, uh, crowdfunding. People have to be creative in, in the face of the realities of the world. Can Can you clarify a point? Uh, so, if let's say the the J.K. Rowling one, it, she she writes this book. Um, if, if there were no property rights at all, would a studio then be able to create a movie? Yes. And, and she would have no say over that. Well, I don't know if she'd have any say over it. Maybe she would. Maybe. I mean, I, I posited. So for example, um, she writes her first book. She self, she self publishes her first Harry Potter book. She doesn't expect it to be popular, but Hey, 20 million kids around the world read it. She, all of a sudden she's popular, which is what happened. Right. So, Hey, she knows, and she, she makes, 10 million bucks off of it, but then competitors swoop in right away. So her profits go, go away, let's say, uh, which I don't think would happen, but let's say, let's say that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, So now she knows she can write six more books and make lots of money. So she could do, she could do a a pre-sale, like uh, all my fans, you pay me 10 bucks each or five bucks each, and then I'll release it or whatever. So she can make a lot of money that way. So then let's say the first book is so popular in some movie studio starts to make a Harry Potter movie based upon her novel. There may be two or three doing it at the same time, right? Because there's there's a free for all. One of them says, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna partner with J.K. Rowling because then she'll author she'll she'll give it its the blessing, right? And and then her fans will go to the we will sell more tickets than our competitors because we're the authorized official version. So they say, hey, J.K. Rowling, you be a consultant for us. You review it. You give us your input and you give it your final blessing when you think we've done a faithful faithful production of your book. And we'll release this saying Harry uh, J.K. Rowling, the original author, is saying this is the one that my fan should see, and we'll sell three times as many tickets as our as our low level competitors, and we'll give you a cut. Of, we'll give you a cut of the ticket sale. Yeah, so she she could she very well could have a say in the authorized production, and that could help them sell more tickets. Yeah, and that that's basically the creator endorsed mark. Um, exactly. Yeah, and so I actually read your older article, I think it was from 2010 about the creator endorsed Mark um, this morning as I was going through and doing some research for this podcast and explain, I think this is really interesting. You touched on it earlier, but explain how a creator could prevent a movie studio from um, 
um, duplicating their mark and misrepresenting to the public that the oh. creator has endorsed the movie. <laughs> yeah, so so then you'll have people say, "Well, if if you if you're relying upon this private alternative creator endorsed mark idea, then then you need trademark law to back that up, right? <laughs> that that's the idea. So first of all, let me explain this. When people say, "Tell me exactly how people are going to make money in a free society," if we get, it's like. I mean, my first answer is I don't know. You know, it's like you know, in the Soviet Union, if you if you told people we need to get rid of government grocery stores and government manufacturer shoes and belts, and they said, well, how many how many brands of underwear will there be in in a free market? I mean, I don't know. Maybe there'll be three, ten, twenty. I, I can't predict exactly unless I, I see another free society. I can guess based upon. But the point is. You don't say, well, unless you can predict exactly what a free society is going to look like, we're going to keep the restrictions in place. All we know is the restrictions are unjust and they're causing distortion. And when you release them, things will change because distortions are real and they have and these laws have an effect. So things will change and people will have to adapt. So I don't I, I sometimes don't like to answer these questions because these people want to guarantee they want me to say, well, I'm not going to favor the repeal of IP law unless you guarantee that uh, every poet in the world is going to be able to make a living. It's like, well, I can't guarantee that, and I don't know how they're going to do it. It's the same thing with welfare. It's like you know when we say we should abolish welfare and the welfare state, it says, well, can you guarantee that every poor child is going to get food and every poor child is going to get an education in this private education system we favor? It's like, well, I have some idea of how it would work. And we'd all be better off, and it's unjust to what we're doing right now. But I'm not going to give you a guarantee because that's the whole point of the socialist system is you want guarantees. And by the way, the socialist system don't give a guarantee anyway because they always go bankrupt. I mean social security recipients don't have a guarantee they're going to get paid in 30 years. <laughs> the whole thing is ridiculous, right? Um, it, when you have socialized medicine, people have cues and they, they, they die because they can't get a heart transplant or whatever because you know there's no guarantees in the world. So my system can't guarantee it either. The creator-endorsed market just one – and the thing I gave you with Rolling is just one guess as to what might happen. There are probably lots of other creative things people would, would do. But now, back to your question. Let's suppose you did this creator endorsed mark, or the, or let's just take the example I gave. Harry uh, J.K. Rowling says, um, uh, "I'm going to give my endorsement to movie number one." And let's say movie number two comes out, and they actually lie and they say. Oh, we also have J.K. Rowling's endorsement. So that's just a factual matter. I mean, the world doesn't need intellectual property law to know facts, which some IP advocates say, which is ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> if if movie studio number two actually puts out this Harry Potter movie and says this is endorsed by J.K. Rowling, she's just going to come online on YouTube and deny it, and they're going to look like idiots, right? I mean, this happens all the time with movies. Like when you have a movie. Uh, they put the quotes of the critics up on the movie poster. Like they'll say, oh, Roger Ebert says this is the best movie ever. Now, if a horrible movie came out and Roger Ebert gave it a zero star review, now he, he died a few years ago. This is old, old, you know, who's a modern, uh, who's a modern movie critic? I don't know. I don't know if there's even movie. The, the critical movie. drinker on YouTube does some really okay. good stuff. The critical so. drinker says uh, the new Jackass movie. I give it one star out of five. It just sucks, right? And then the Jackass producers start advertising it saying the best movie ever by the critical Jackass, whatever. The critical Critical Drinker. Name? Critical Drinker. The critical Drinker. I mean, he's just gonna he's just gonna post on Twitter saying they're yeah. they're freaking lying. And everyone's gonna know that the movie is not only bad, but but they're dishonest. I mean, it just yeah, doesn't yeah. work. You just can't well, Basically, so, people have the right to lie, and people have right. the right to listen to lies. But if you lie, you're going to be caught. Well, it makes it. I, I constantly think about this idea that we're, we solve, uh, you know, solutions for 20, uh, 20th century uh, problems, I mean, but we're living in the twenty first century. Like, what are the changes? What are the dynamics? I mean, to your point, like, you know, we, we uh, Scott and I were talking offline about The Rock. The Rock as a as a publication machine, right? The guy has his own. A constellation of what he does for social media. And um, uh, you can see what he does on Instagram to be promoting movies. So when you hire him, you're not just, you're not just hiring him for the talent. You're not just hiring from the PR. He's got this whole thing that he's able to bring to whatever project. Well, the Correct. same can go for like the fact that any person in, t in the internet allows you, it, unless you're in places in which the internet's censored um, or more heavily censored than what we're experiencing in the US, um, they can speak directly to the audience. Correct. Right. Yes, that, of course. Of they, course. They, they, they have the path, and 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 actually, what what begs the question? Then exactly, I think the point you're 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 bringing up is we don't know what those systems could look like if you took off some of these barriers. Like, how would they evolve to where artists would have the main line and where 
they would uh, be able to speak. I mean, the question comes up, hey, Lucas, did you make this other Star Wars movie? I saw it. It was garbage. Uh, and he says, yeah, no, it wasn't me. And, um, you know, I'm glad I'm, I'm sorry you had to watch this terrible trash. But not um, only that, everyone would know, uh, you know, people, all these fans would be out there. There'd be websites talking, oh, there's a new yeah. Star Wars movie coming out. It's not endorsed by Lucas, but let's let's see if it's any good. It's fan, it's fan fiction or whatever. Fan, yeah. You know, people overestimate the role IP actually plays today. So, for example, they mistakenly believe that it's behind the social prohibition against plagiarism. It's not. It's got nothing to do with it. In fact, for example, if you wanted to sell uh, Moby Dick tomorrow under your name on Amazon – that's not copyright violation because it's out of copyright. But no one, no one does that. It's not a problem. Why does no one do it? Because it would be pointless. Because no one's going to buy Moby Dick by Stephen Kinsella because they know I didn't write it. Because there's a social fact that people already know that Melville wrote it. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just it's just pointless. Um, and likewise, all these endorsements by The Rock and other people that happen right now, like all these uh, social media influencers, they're just doing this as a phenomenon in the world. It's not protected by copyright or patent right. really or even trademark they just they they actually go online or somewhere and they say i endorse this makeup product or whatever i, I mean you know oprah winfrey has a book club and she says i recommend this book this month you could have someone publish a book tomorrow and they could put on the back cover oprah winfrey endorsed this book and they could lie but why don't but that's not a copyright infringement to do that yeah. it's not a trademark infringement it it probably is something she could find something to sue you for but it's not ip law it's something else mm. it might be contract breach it might be fraud it might be a right of publicity which is a type of ip which i i think we should get rid of but the point is it's not ra a rampant problem that we have to combat and when it happens on occasion everyone knows it you know uh if you go to china and you buy a car that looks like a Mercedes, you pretty much know it's not a Mercedes. <laughs> if you buy an iPhone knockoff, you know it's not a real iPhone. You yeah. know, if you buy a fake Rolex for $35 in New York City in an alley, you know it's not a real Rolex. Yeah, when when the Apple's upside down, you know that it's not a real iPhone. If you need markers, okay, just be on the outlook, right? <laughs> And people say things like, well, you, if without trademark law, you uh, you could have people just uh, – you anyone can use the name of a proper – so let's say you go to a grocery store and you buy Crest toothpaste and it turns out to be knockoff Crest. Well, you got to buy it from some grocery store. Let's say it's a Kroger, a big national chain, and it turns out that Kroger is supplying knockoff Crest. What do you think is going to happen? The word's going to get out. People are going to quit going to Kroger. So Kroger has an incentive to only buy Crest toothpaste from the original manufacturer of Crest, not some Chinese knockoff. I mean, these problems are not real problems because they're just not real problems. And IP law doesn't solve them now. They don't need to solve it now, and it wouldn't solve it anyway. So it's people come up with all these fake arguments for IP, like, oh, so you must be in favor of plagiarism. You must be in favor of fraud. I guess it's okay if I just take your intellectual property book and put my name on it and make a million dollars, which is just retarded. I mean, I didn't make a million dollars off of my IP pamphlet. I made almost nothing because this is a <laughs> it's just a stupid I mean, nonfiction books don't make that much money. Yeah. But if you could actually take my book and put your name on it and make a million dollars, please do so because I'd love to learn that technique. You know what I mean? Well, I, I, I say I, I've questioned like I think about places with what we could maybe call weak, uh, weak intellectual property rights. So I'm thinking about like Africa. Um, you, you mentioned sort of Asia and be able to go there, but like, I, so I grew up in Saudi Arabia and this was in the eighties, nineties. And you know, there was a lot of, you, you see some movies like there's son of Rambo. I'm not sure if you know that movie, but it's, it's like them recreating Rambo scenes as kids. Um, and then there's like these posters that you would see in, um, in restaurants. There's these great ones in Egypt where it's like, Stallone standing up, but like he, but they've had to like, uh, because they couldn't actually get the posters, they had to like draw them out. Um, and everyone was always talking about like, this is a bad thing, right? Like they, they, they don't have property rights. We should have all the right posters. But I, I guess a question I have is like in areas like this, where maybe the property rights aren't enforced, do we see more creation, more creativity? Um, like Africa comes to mind more than like authoritarian regimes like you may see in Saudi Arabia where they would clamp down. But like, do you, do you see more uh, proliferation of ideas? Um, oh, that's I mean, interesting. I um, well, probably not, but I, I would say that, you know, the West is a bigger innovator because of our wealth and our, our technology, our technology and our history. Uh, people often say the, the essential 
claim there is 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 the is the fallacy of mistaking um, correlate, correlation with causation, right? So the West is richer than than the the the, the South or whatever you want to call the the, the developing countries. Um, and we started getting richer with the Industrial Revolution around 1800, which is when the U.S. started and when we started having copyright and patent laws. So therefore, that must be the reason, right? Um, there is no doubt that we've had more technological innovation in, in the U.K. and in Europe and in America uh, in the last 200 years. But to say that it's because of patent law is just assuming that there's causation when there's correlation. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, there's any number of things you could correlate. You could correlate it with imperialism and with Western colonization, and with with and with tariffs and with uh, with central banking and with having a war every ten years, which we've done for two hundred years. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with high high taxation the last yeah. uh, hundred seventy years or whatever. Uh, there's no reason to think these things are the cause of that. Uh, and there's every reason to think that we would have more innovation without it. But again, if you if you if you make justice your load stone where you know the purpose of law is to recognize identify and enforce property rights to do justice so that people can live and navigate within th this kind of stable system and then figure out their lives uh, that's the purpose of law it's not to just pick some arbitrary goal like okay the goal is to have everyone have a phd in physics yeah we could do that could be our goal i guess you could pick an arbitrary goal the goal is to have school vouchers Okay. The goal is to, to land on the moon. That was a goal, right? The goal is to land on the moon. Okay. <laughs> or the goal is to only have 1.8 degrees Celsius global warming in the next 75 years. <laughs> you can pick whatever goal you want that's an arbitrary goal that the government is going to bend and contort every law and every right to achieve. But and it, it could also be maximize innovation or optimize. But why? Why not? Why shouldn't the goal be justice, <laughs> which is the whole purpose of law in the first place? And justice is, is justice is giving someone their due, and their due depends upon what their property rights are. And the way we determine that is the classical principles of Locke. Excellent. I think that is a great example of how the market can manage all of this without the need for government being in the middle of everything. Um, the market just essentially police itself. So um, we're a little over an hour here and we committed to keep you in there for an hour. So Paul, do you have anything else? No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and, and hearing uh, these ideas I've uh, read about in the past, but it's, it's great to hear an expert talk about it. So I really appreciate the time and everything you shared. Yeah, that was, and that was just barely scratching the surface. <laughs> I'm sure. So um, if people wanted to find out more about this topic, about IP law and about your thoughts on it and why it's uh, why it's a terrible thing and it destroys innovation and anything we talked about here, what are two or three places they could go to find out more information? Well, my general stuff is at stephankinsella.com, but I've, I've kind of moved a lot of the IP intellectual property stuff onto c4sif.org. Okay. And we will go ahead and link to all of that. And anything else before we close out? No, that's it. I appreciate it. Good questions, guys. Awesome. This was a real pleasure. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Cheers.